uh, kind of have it open for about two weeks, and then um, we will have a little face-off and uh, get these things um, pretty sure under contract and uh, make our clients happy because it is it's a little unique when you do that, but we're seeing new construction doing it all the time. So we stole a little play from their playbook and uh, feel pretty excited to get those up and running as well this weekend. No, I, I totally agree with you. I mean, it's when I first came across it, I wasn't quite, quite sure what was going on. It was, it was an expired property that was basically back in October of last year. And so when I looked at it, I'm like, hmm, 11 bedrooms, like seven bathrooms for like 1.9 million. What is going on with this one? But then after we got into uh, more discussions and dissecting it, it's basically, as you said, it's a, the family. They each have their own property and sort of like their own um, compound, you want to call it that. And they're looking to get them all sold together, at least closed all together and, and then move on, which it's that's a first it's new charted territory for me. So I know you talked about, you know, in subdivisions, but for a regular family, this is a new one for me. Yeah, it is. It's But, you know, here's the thing. For those that are listening on here, you have to think outside the box and you can't be staying in the narrow passages of what you've got going on. You have to be able to say, like, OK, let's take a look at our challenge. Let's see what their result is. We know that they want to sell their property, but what's important to them? And timing was the most important item. And so, like, literally, I, I one of the uh, – new construction companies in our area they just did this and i was doing it for a buyer and i was like wait a minute what are you guys doing they're like oh yeah we just take all the offers they have this certain time period to submit them and then what we do is we just uh in their case it was a lottery but for our case it's like they all have to like for that it's like all had to be done at the same time they choose them at the same time and then they go from there so uh, i was like wait a minute i think we could use this for us so the presentation, do you think that was the presentation that won the deal for us in that sort of discussion? Instead of just saying, you know, we're going to try our best to try to get all three homes sold. They're like, so what are you guys going to do differently, right? Well, and, and here's the thing. So if you're a real estate agent listening to this, one of the things that I would share to you in any sales tactic or any sales strategy you're trying to do is you got to hear what their problem is. You got to be able to see what it is. And so to me, being a football coach, it's like, okay, this is what their offensive playbook is sharing with me. What are we going to do to adapt to it? Or how are we going to be able to create a really good play with it? Because when it's all said and done with, yeah, we want to sell your house. But then it's like, okay, what are we going to do to sell the house? And what game plan do we have to be able to share it with them that they feel confident in what we're doing? And so when you, when you develop the play, you got to believe in it yourself. And then once you believe in it, then you have to figure out a way to share it. But it's also, even though that you're sharing it, you got to have some confidence behind it. And I don't know if I would have at the time period. I think God aligned it up perfectly because I literally just did this with the new construction with True Homes. And then it, uh, I remember I was in New York and I called you. I was like, Greg, it came to me last night. And so that's kind of how it all established and i and i do think i think it was the way that we presented it but not only presentation but we believe in it that it's going to work and in this market right now we have a small window to take advantage of that well i think the other thing that was really unique is that i just got off the phone with another individual who is talking about selling their property and he said you know i don't i don't know how what you guys are doing down here there's like twenty thousand agents just in the charlotte market and there's only probably like 1,100 homes that you're all going after. So for me, I've been working with this family since October. So it's been, it's been a nurturing process. It's been a following up process. To, to, you get to the point where when you call them, they know who you are. They're like, hey, Greg, yeah, great. How are you? Thanks for following up. Thanks for staying in contact. You know, we're still thinking about getting all this done. You know, we got to get some, we got to get everybody on board. You know, we got to get all the family together. We just can't have two out of the three, that sort of thing. So, you know, you really got to build a rapport and a relationship over the period of time. I mean, can you just go out and, you know, do a, do a one and done on an, on an interview? You can, but with the amount of competition that we have in this market, I mean, to me, the way that we're getting our listings is by nurturing, following up, 
and you build a relationship even before you get the property, even before you even go over there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, 100%. The follow-up, and, and I think today we're talking about this too, that there's, there's situations, there's things that are taking place right now in our market, in our society, in our world that we have to make sure that we keep track of to understand what is taking place because follow-up is such a key ingredient but then understanding what's happening in the season of real estate to be able to solve these problems. Um, for example, one of the things we're going to talk about a little bit later on is the interest rates, like understanding that, but then being able to educate your client. And that's part of your follow up. It's like, you're not just saying, Hey, Greg, I'm ready to sell my, you know, you're ready to sell your house. I'm here. Well, you got to pour in some value. And we're going to talk about these eyes very shortly here of what this value looks like. So that way they can get a sense. The seller can get an idea and pouring into them. So before we get into that that topic is so we want everyone to know that we're going to be that's going to be the focus of this podcast. But I want since you're you just came back from New York, why don't you share a little bit about like why you went up there? What are you doing up there? What did you accomplish in just the you know the four or five days that you're up in New York? In all that snow, I'm sure you just loved all that snow as well. So. Oh yeah, it was it was a, little, a lot chillier. I mean, it's beautiful here in Charlotte. It's supposed to be upper 70s this weekend, so a little different of uh, two tales of weather, that's for sure. So the main focus is uh, we are growing in the uh, New York market, New York, upstate New York, Binghamton, Syracuse area is actually my hometown, and so I lived up there for about 21 years, 22 years, and so. Uh, I still have ties up there, connections, and so one of them is my cousin, and uh, he has his real estate license. And so with EXP, we have the opportunity to work nationally, as well as it doesn't cost you anything besides your expenses of, of running an organization up there. So you don't have to pay for office space or anything else. It's just all under one umbrella, and that was one of the key ingredients that I loved with the company was giving me that opportunity to go in different states and different areas, and it doesn't cost me anything. And so Denny and I had a great, great conversation up there. I was like, listen, I want to get up there. Let's let's start making phone calls. Let's start reaching out. And so, uh, as you know, I do a lot of expires and FISBOs just as much. And we script, role play, and we do that. And so we started doing that up in New York. We got some listings up there. The listings created activity. The activity created other people. So we have also sphere of influence where we have people that said, hey, I didn't know you were coming up here. We actually, I'm thinking about selling my place. And we ended up getting three listings while I was up there. And it was pretty cool. And it was a great for the for for the energy and the synergy up there to be like, wow, this is, look, look, what, look what just cultivated what happened. Now we're trying to get photographers, attorneys, inspectors. And now our Facebook, my Facebook is blowing up. And it's just very positive stuff up there. But, you know, it's, it's a little bit over a year it's taken us to get to this point. And a lot of times in trips up there where you're kind of talking to yourself and nobody's around and things weren't going the way they needed. COVID was in high demand. And so it was a huge mindset shift to be able to get over that little disappointment and like, maybe this is not what I should be doing. Who knows about this? And so you have to get over those hurdles and those challenges. And so, so far, so good, and things have really been booming. Actually, I'm getting ready to do a post is because I need another agent up there. Like we we have Dennis up there right now, and he's doing it, but he's also managing part time, and so we got to figure out. I got to get another agent up there, and so we're getting ready to do some hiring, which then expands another problem that we have. But you know what? It's just it's just good problems to have. It's it's just really good problems, and very fortunate. Right, you've got business, and now you need to add. You need to grow, and and so. If you're listening to this podcast and you're in upstate New York, give us a shout out and, yeah, and we'll, we can definitely talk to you about how you can get on board. So, all right. Now, let's talk about what the focus of this podcast is going to be, because I know this is something that's important to you and I'm going to let you sort of like run with it. I know there was a number of things that you talked about over the last week as far as growth is concerned and how we grow and does it does it happen right away or you know does it take time, but... I, I don't want to add anything extra into the mix. So you just just go ahead and do your thing and and we'll just we'll just stay right right with you on this one. Okay. Well, when when going into certain things and I've been working with some different coaches that I work with across the country and we started talking about a lot of uh, challenges that we're facing in the real estate market. And, and then I was like, okay, maybe we do an event. And, 
And so we've been tossing and turning through the event. But one of the things that is always challenging when you're creating an event is what what's the topic name? What's what's a what is something that you can create that catches people's attention? And I'm like, well, it's March, St. Patty's Day. But one of the I remember reading this, and for those that maybe remember back in your literature days, but the Ides of March, and it's actually a Latin word of Idis Marti, Artis Marti. And it was back in the old days where Julius Caesar and talks about the Ides of March and, and everything that kind of took place with it. And it was marked as a religious holiday and with the Romans and what was going back on with the assassination of Julius Caesar. But the Ides of March came to me because there are four eyes that we're going to talk about today that affect the real estate market. And what we faced last spring and what we're facing two years ago, I remember to this day in March, I remember sitting with Mike Castro and our guys on our team. And he said to me, what are we going to do about this COVID thing? I said, COVID? I said, buddy, it's in China. It's not going to really affect us. We're not going to really have any problems with it. And then boy, oh boy, did it come at us and did it come strong. And so I remember that everything got shut down. And two years ago, we're in a totally different world than we are now because back in March and April, it shifted our, our society in where we are as of today and how things how things are and related. And I think pretty much we can all agree that we all know that when you say COVID, it's like, oh boy, like we all know it. it's a, it's a, a global word. And so the Ides of March to me was just something that I remember in literature, but now we're going to talk about the four eyes. And I want you, Greg, to add in whatever you like to in the real estate world, because to me, you're seeing it firsthand as well. And so the first I that we're going to talk about is something that it doesn't matter what is going on in your life. It doesn't matter what, what business, a W-2, a school teacher, anything you do, you are facing this one eye. And this one eye happens when you go to the grocery store, when you go to the gas station, and you get a little upset when you have 13 things in your cart and they say, that'll be $136, please. And you're like, What? And I remember with my daughter, Brielle, I was like, Brielle, we just got 13 things here and it cost us literally $136 and that's called inflation. Inflation is taking over all over. Ironically, they just did the um, uh, – President Biden just did his uh, address of the uh, State country. of the Union, yeah. Mm -hmm. State of the Union and inflation is a big item, guys. Inflation is happening to fill up your gas tank now. I'm pretty sure inflation is not matching the increase in your paycheck. I'm, I'm pretty sure of it. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, Greg, but I'm pretty sure majority of W-2 employees and majority of people are still getting paid the same amount, but everything is increasing across the board. No, I mean, 100%. So just even from historically, inflation never rises at the same pace as paychecks or salaries. And, but it's usually somewhere about 2 2.5%. In inflation, and then there's other factors that that we have to take into account. But I mean, we're looking at somewhere around seven percent, which is oh yeah, that's up there. And I and, and in certain places, depending on what the um, what's going on in where you are of what part of the country you're in, I mean, they're double digit inflation numbers. Um, I know here in in the Charlotte area and Lake Norman where it's very affluent, I mean, we're seeing some of these numbers at 14, 15%. And that's a big number, guys. I mean, across the country, we're, we're, we're flirting with almost 10%. And these numbers are huge when it comes time for what we're seeing. I mean, we're, we're per looking at close to 8%, which hurts you. I mean, you don't have as much money to be able to put in your savings account. You don't have as much money to pay your mortgage. You don't have as much money to do all these little things that you wanna do because at the end of the day, when you look at your net number of how much money you have, you're like, well, I, um, I don't have that much money. I, I used to have maybe like, I don't know, 500 bucks and now paying gas, doing this. We're also coming into springtime. So we're doing more, we're outside landscaping, we're going to Lowe's, Home Depot, outdoor places. I mean, all these things affect you. So inflation, inflation, inflation is really going to hurt us 
um, as we move forward. And people ask me, well, how long is this market going to last? It's going to last a couple more months, but it's eventually going to, we're going to have some challenges. So the first I I want to talk about today is inflation. All right. The second I that takes place is one of our favorite questions that our lenders have to deal with interest rates. And I'm pretty sure, Greg, you know exactly that the rates of last year compared to where they are today are not the same. And they've gone up, right? Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. We just actually just finished the podcast uh, about a week or so ago, um, our State of the Union, uh, real estately speaking, and we talked about interest rates and what the Feds are going to do. So March 15th may be the next rate hike that we're going to see. Mm -hmm. and, and it's pretty certain we're going to see that. Um, it's just – it's how it happens now. Unfortunately, we're also dealing with a global situation of dealing with the war with Russia and Ukraine. Typically, war keeps the interest rates down, but because of the challenges we're facing in the economy, we're still more than likely going to see a, a, an increase. And with that increase, what happens is, is what you are paying for at a $500,000 home at an uh, interest rate of 3.25%, you jack that thing up to 3.75%, and your monthly payments are going to go up. It is just, it is what it is. Well, then the buyer says to you, wait a minute, I can't afford that. Well, Okay, we got ourselves a little bit of a problem. Here's the big elephant in the room that people need to ask. I'm going to, if you're writing stuff down, guys, this is what you need to ask your lender. This is what our team practices, and this is what they do. What we do, Mr. Lender, Mrs. Lender, what is the cost of your interest rate lock? That's your first question you need to ask. Part two to that is how far out can you lock me in? Guys, those two questions are so, so very important. If you're working with a buyer agent right now, you better make sure that your buyer agent is asking your lender. You better go and call your lender. How much is my, my rate lock? Because these rates are going to go up. They are going to go. Um, new construction. You got to make sure new construction. New construction is pretty heavy in Charlotte right now. When you close on this, it's going to be different in six to nine months. That's the average built out, six to nine months right now because of the materials, the cost, the way things are getting there. But interest rates are going to be a huge, huge thing. Greg, based off of the State of the Union that you talked about with um, your buddy there when you guys did yours, like share with me anything that you're seeing on interest rates or anything that that you know that's cultivating on, on what you're seeing just talking to some of the clients you're working with. Well, we already know that it's the number one topic right now that people who are looking to buy, it's like right now some of them are trying to, you know, they're trying to get on this this train, right? How much money can I get out of my house train, which is moving very fast. But their biggest question is, so how much is it going to cost me to get out of my home? And mm -hmm. if interest rates are going to go up, then how much more is it going to cost me? But the focus really for the podcast that we did with Michael Curtis it was basically he, he sort of felt that that was a positive move by the Fed and by also the, the lenders, right? Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac is because he believes that of adding the interest rates into this economy because of the way that the home prices have gone up, that it's basically helping the real estate market by in, in increasing the interest rates. And that was his take on it. Even though that we did see last year – that there was at least, I think, 72% of buyers had some dissatisfaction in their home purchase. Pricing was number one. This is the focus. The number one topic was real estate. But right now, the number one topic is how much is it going to cost me now in the next few months? Because the Fed has already come out. They, they waved the flag. The interest rate flag is up, and everybody knows what's going to happen. What you're saying is, is so important because you need to know – if you're going to go from, you know, a $500,000 home into a $700,000 home, based on the interest rates, based on how much you're going to put down, what is going to be the cost for you to get there? And that's part of the challenge that we are dealing with with our sellers who want to, who want to purchase right here in our own market, in, in the Charlotte market. And let me, if you're okay with this, Greg, I, I want to dive just a little bit deeper into this 
and here's our challenge, guys. So why we say between 300 and 500 is because what we see, and it varies on where you are in this country. I, I get it. But for the most part, for what we see with the CFO of the NAR shares with us, the chief financial officer with the National Association of Realtors says is this, that $300,000 and less is very challenging for FHA buyers. So the interest rates are really not affected with people at that price point because FHA buyers aren't really getting it. And what's happening is, is most of those buyers in that area are, are cash buyers. So the rate doesn't really shift to them so much. Where it shifts is when you have a higher price point. And in that higher price point, when you have a half a percent difference, okay, and then you add inflation to the mix, and then very shortly, we're going to tell you the third eye. When you put those two components together, that shifts your buyer audience. So your buyer audience that once was possibly, you know, pretty healthy and, and a good amount of people between a 450 and a 500, that could shift now because now they can't afford that. So now they have to go lower. So now you're taking your 500 and your 525, your 550 people, and they're going to drop down. Well, now they're dropping down and their expectations are much higher because they looked at nicer homes, right? So now when they go and look at homes and the seller's like, hey, look at me, I got all these showings. The buyer's like, I'm not paying you that much anymore. And by the way, if I pay that, I'm not going to pay as much due diligence. I'm not going to put as much earnest money. Oh, and by the way, when my inspection comes, oh, no, you don't get to walk away, seller, with not fixing anything. I want this now. And they're going to have a higher demand now. And they're going to be able to start to shift that into it because they're going to be able to be like, hey, sellers, you're not getting as much as you thought you were getting anymore. And so this will have effects. So why the, the lenders and they're saying this is a good thing? It is because this market is unhealthy. Remember the one we just did, Greg, where we had it listed at 330 and we got an offer at 350 and now we got an appraisal issue. Like this isn't good for anybody. It's not good for the seller. It's not good for the buyers, not good for any of the agents. It's not good for the appraiser because all we're doing now is looking at the appraiser and blaming him for this problem, which really he's probably looking at the market and saying, well, guys, this is really inflated. And then it gets us into another problem. Right. But I think that, though, even in our business of real estate, we always we are always dealing with an appraisal issue. Right. And so I don't always I'm not really looking at the if the appraisals are coming in, in low, that it means that these home prices are too high because it's all depends on who's going out there and doing that appraisal. So that's part of the mix that we have to deal with. But yeah. I think the question is really is from the buyer's perspective is. As the number of those three things that you basically said, right? And the due diligence is one, how much, how much am I going to come in with? And then once I get into the home, what do I have to do in any repairs? And so the biggest challenge for buyers in this market is that a lot of those things have been, they can't really settle on one of those. They either have to say, this is the home. There's only one here for me to buy and I got to go after it. And that is what has been tripping our market here in, in the Charlotte market, because it's a demand market. So if we had a normal real estate market, then some of those other scenarios that they've been thinking about going into the home would be on their mind, but they know they have to get a home and they know they have to beat the eye buyer. They have to beat someone who's coming in with cash, coming in with forty, fifty thousand dollars due diligence. And so they're going to say these other things that I would really care about. I, I can't deal with that because I'll never get a home if I, if I stand on my ground, would you agree with that? 100%. And it's, and I could, I, I hear it at the tip of your tongue because you're, you're so, so right. And we're getting ready to touch on that, that third eye. And I'm just going to say it out loud and then we'll just, we'll, we'll come back to it. But it's the inventory. We have problems with inventory because like you just said, there's not a lot of options for these buyers. That's the biggest challenge that you have. So, so when you take a look at the inflation, then you throw in the interest rates, and now these buyers are just like, well, this is all we have, and then we're dealing with what's going on in the home and everything else under the sun. We talk about appraisals. I mean, there's just so many different things, and then you're just like, well, hell, Greg. There's, I mean, you told me you set me up buyers, and you only gave me four homes, and we're like, well, um, yeah, 
that's that's what's on the market. I think I just did something uh, the other day of how many homes are in, in the entire country. The entire country is down, I think, like 200,000 homes from what the normal market is. I mean, there's only 860,000 homes in our entire country right now for sale. Mm -hmm. Well, you think about this because you brought up the COVID factor, right, which was a disruptor. And two mm -hmm. years ago, I was, I think I was in a studio doing a podcast and we're like, well, so what are we going to do? Are we going to be shut down or we're not going to have to do anything? And so I did a podcast with an agent that was up in Michigan. Their MLS was 65% less than it was before during COVID. So look at it that way. I mean, our territory, our inventory territory from COVID, you would think that we would have a just a burst of homes flooding the market now because of what we sat through during COVID. And that's not the case. So why yep. is that? And, it, it, and so, I mean, you're on the phones a lot. And the biggest objection that I hear right now from true sellers, true sellers saying, I don't know where I'm going to move to. I've looked at homes and all the homes that are similar to mine, just me just to, to make a sideways lateral move the home prices are like ridiculously expensive. So we might as well just sit here and wait it out. And so they're waiting and they're not putting their house on the market. And then because they can't find a house. And so it has this domino effect and you're like, well, if I could show you off market homes for you to take a look at it, and that's part of our scripts that we have, but it just becomes a domino. But what it, what it really does is it just pushes the brakes down on people because if they could find a home, They'd want to sell their property instantaneously right now, right? Mm -hmm, exactly, exactly, because we already talked about that. I think that the other reason that inventory, it's also because of the buyer fatigue that they just went through last year, right? How many times yep. can you put an offer in on, on, a, on a property and you lose out? And so unless you really are going to, you know, you come in with full force, you throw everything out there to get the home, so you clear out, you clear the road, so you're the only buyer, so the other four or five buyers that are behind you, this is what we're dealing with. So I think that that's one of the, the factors. We have the inventory that's low because home prices continue to rise, especially in our market, 2022 here, close to probably 20%. But now you've had buyers that have like, think of it this way. Look at like Rocky Three. You know, yeah, it's like round 15. How many more punches <laughs> are you going to be able to take in this buyer field? These buyers are like, you know what? I'm just going to sit it out and I'm not going out there anymore. I'm like pretty much, I'm, I'm like done. And so now mm -hmm. we have less buyers with less inventory. So we, we have to figure out what's going to cultivate this real estate market. So where people get excited about going out and buying a home where they feel good that what the, the hard earned money that they're spending for these homes with the rate of inflation that they think they're getting their money's worth. And, and the statistic last year did not show that. They thought it was the opposite. The second yep. issue that they dealt with was the price per square foot was smaller than they would have purchased in a normal real estate market. So they they over they had to overpay, and then they got a smaller home that's not what they wanted. So and then it was location. Location was number three. So they had to they had to figure out you know if you really want a home in this scarcity market, you got to pick one objective that you're going to have to try to stay on, and that was always on price. Yep. I tell you, you're like leading into perfect transitions and segues because you you said it perfectly where buyers are getting so frustrated, the buyer fatigue, because, I mean, think about Mike Castor of, of this one that he was dealing with. And I think Heather also on our team was dealing with another one. It's like, oh, I showed five homes. I put in five offers. We lost all five of them. We were dealing with multiple offers. We were dealing with this. Um uh, there's 27 people waiting in line. Like, and buyers like, you know what? Screw it. I don't even want to. I don't even want to deal with it. I even tell sellers too, like listing agents, like be careful what you. Be careful on how many you tell the buyers. Like, hey, we got multiple offers. That scares people now. Like, it really scares a lot of these buyers. Like, I've already lost four of them. I didn't want to go through that emotional turmoil again. And so, when you said that. 
it like leads right into the fourth eye. And the fourth eye is the most important eye. And that is the eye of you yourself. I, Brock, Zevian. I, Greg. Like you right here, you have to be, you have to turn into almost a consultant to be able to get your mindset right for these buyers saying, listen, I got to set the expectations for you right here, right now, because this is going to be a journey and this is going to be a challenge. But this is why you hire me is to try to help you understand what this is embarkment is going to be because it's tough. We're going to go in here and we might be up against five or six offers. And I just want you to know, there's a very good chance that we could lose these things. Because if we're not there in their corner, cheering them on and motivating them as well as ourselves, I mean, I'm pretty sure if you start talking to these real estate agents who are driving and praying and hoping and opening doors and keep driving and do you need lunch and where are we here and oh, we're going back out again this weekend. And if you got a family, it's like, honey, I'm sorry, I got to go back out again. I got to go try to find my more homes. And they're like, what do you mean? You've already been, I mean, you're going to get bombarded. And it's very hard to wake up and be like, oh, I can't wait to go show a home again today just to get deflated that we don't get it. So the emotional aspect of the eye of yourself, you have to stay in a positive mindset because if you start just feeling, like, eh, why are we even going to go? Like, what's the point? I mean, guys, seriously, there's six offers. You don't have cash. You don't want to put two to it. Like, now we're talking them out of it. I just go back to Mike Kastner's deal with as many things that he went through. I mean, it's just, you have to have that positive mindset. And I mean, Greg, you and I were doing uh, prayer calls, accountability calls. We're doing all this stuff. I mean, got to believe out there. That's probably one of the biggest challenges is just the mindset. I mean, absolutely. It's, you have to sort of, this, if you said, even from the beginning that you have to really dive deep into what their needs are, because that's exactly what, you need to know because if there's a few things there that you don't understand what their position is when they're going out in this market, then they're going to get trampled on and it's not going to go well for you. So you have to pull out a lot of more things for these people. Just like the gentleman I was talking with, he would love to sell his home right now. He doesn't have a problem mm. with it. He doesn't even have his home on the market, Brock, and he already got someone who contacted him is going to give him a cash offer and his home's not even on the market. And so he's like, yeah. okay, well, I can probably take this, but he's like, where am I going to go? Because I don't want to spend these, these high priced homes that we would have to go into. So he's like, so should we wait? So maybe we should wait three to six months, or maybe we should wait. And he said, some of the people are telling him to wait until 2023. We don't have a crystal ball. We can't see that far in the future. We have no idea as far as where inflation is going to be, all these things that you said, the first three I's, right? So inflation, interest rate, and inventory, all of those things fluctuate. It's like the stock market. They're, they yeah. are. Those are all you know things that are, are movable pieces. But what about the buyer? The buyer's got a position that they want to be in a certain home. And if unless it's new construction, then that's the biggest challenge. Because as I just found out, in Mecklenburg County here, which is one of our largest counties, it's uh, in the Charlotte area, they are putting a restriction on the amount of new construction homes that can be built. They don't want to have too many flooding the market. I, I don't know, you know what's behind all of that, but so now you have builders who are, are restricted in the amount of homes that they can put up right away. So now you only have so many buyers who can go out and try to put down their application to get into their new construction. And then, so what about all the other ones now who are driving through these new communities waiting for the, the new build to get done? How many homes are going to be available? So, so these are all new challenges for the buyer mm -hmm. that you have to really, you, you have to spend time with them and you have to let them know that it's, it's not going to be a cakewalk out there for you. Absolutely. And one of the things that I, that we talk about when we teach and you nailed it right there too when you said this is like you have to have a buyer consultation i got one coming up friday and she's in new jersey and i was just like hey i'd like to be able to do a zoom call with you and do a buyer consultation she's like excuse me say that again i said a buyer consultation she's like 
I've bought several homes and I've never heard anybody ever ask that to me. I said, well, here's what I've learned, that if I don't set your expectations, you will be very disappointed with me very quickly in this buyer's market. 100% you will be because we're going to have some challenges. We're going to have some new construction because she's she brought up new construction as well. And I will say this. So one of the new construction companies that I work with here in Charlotte is Lennar. And Lennar is one of the homes that I go and I visit the builders and or the people in the model home. And I had to ask them, I said, so how much are you seeing? Like what's going on in your like – because – Remember we talked about the new construction, how they have to do an auction because they have so many people applying and they can only build so many homes as well. Their max is only five per month. And I said, I said, how many homes are you seeing? Or, you know, how many applicants that you're seeing go into this waiting list? Greg, just take a guess on how many people apply each month. I, I mean, I, I can't even come close to the number. I'd say maybe – 45, 50, 60 a month. That's in your – good because that's exactly what I said. I said, I said, David, I don't know, maybe like 45, 50. He goes, Brock, this month alone – let me take a look at my computer. 412. I said, excuse me? He goes, yeah, 412 people are on our waiting list right now. Now talk about – yeah, exactly. Wow. Why is it so important to set the expectations? I mean, because as an agent, I'm saying, wow. And I do this every day. You do this every day. You got people in here who are just like, well, I don't know. Maybe I'll just drive to this new construction and see what happens. Oh, yeah, come on in. Let me show you everything. Their job is to be able to build a relationship. Yeah, yeah, we got a waiting list, but let me just show you the house. Let me show you this, 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 and this. Oh, you got to do this? Okay, great. Well, <clears throat> why don't I just add you to the waiting list here? Okay, great. Brock, we haven't. You, Brock, we haven't had 145 homes, resale homes on the market in the last 72 hours. Yeah. So we don't even have that. We don't even have that many homes out there that people can just, you know, if you got 400 waiting for a new construction, what about the rest? Who there are only 300 homes out there in a, you know, uh, in three counties, four counties here. Yeah. Applying these things, guys. It's tough right now, and I tell this to people all the time. Oh, my gosh, this real estate market. This real estate market, guys, is probably one of the hardest real estate markets I've ever been around because there's no homes to sell. You have tons of buyers, but when you only have 100 and whatever, 117 homes, I don't know what the number was. I'm not in front of my computer, but think about it. There's 15,000 real estate agents in our area Okay, here in Charlotte. If there's only, I don't know, 300 homes in our entire area to sell, that means you're only employing 300 people. And that means if you even got those 300 and you have to get a buyer agent, not including dual agency, and I'll just make it a simple 600, and there's 15,000 people, that means only 1% to 2% of agents are working. I mean – this is an extremely hard market as you're a real estate agent, and you need to be – I tell you it all the time. It's not a lack of inventory. It's a lack of effort. you got to double down on your – triple, quadruple down your effort if you're going to want to try to make it in this business right now. It's very, very hard, and the only way to do it is to pour into your clients, help them out, understand inflation, understand interest rates, understand the, the lack of inventory, and have a positive mindset every day that you're going in there because it's I yourself is what is going to make the difference of how you make your presentations, how you sound knowledgeable to be able to help these people because it is it is just it's going to be a dogfight for these next several months. What are you saying to you know those that are listening that are in in this real estate market that they should really be focusing on more than anything? And I I know you know the answer because we had a great video from Tom Ferry not too long ago. What did he say that we need to do when picking up the phone? What well. I don't know if I, I remember exactly what the Tom Ferry, Ferry said, but I, I'll give you my answer, and then you can you can answer what Tom Ferry said because from what I'm learning and what I'm seeing, one is you have to talk to more people than you've ever talked to before. Two, you have to pour value into people like you've never done before. And three, 
you have to be able consistency every single day to help to help people because you have to stay front of mind and then what you're doing and it echoes across the board because your last five listings that you've gotten in the last 30 days is follow up you got to follow up with people you got to pour in a value and you got to be able to help them find their next house but you got to educate them so i don't know if that's the answer that tom ferry said but that's my answer it just puts it all together he said that in this market of no inventory that's exactly what we need agents need to be focused on going after listings when you just talked about the fact that there's there's only two or three percent of agents that are going to be able to get a paycheck with nothing out there then what does a listing equal it equals a paycheck yep. and so it's it's almost like you have to sort of like harness a larger army out there to get more just like you said, you got to make more phone calls. You got to talk to more people. You you really got to dive into certain in the neighborhoods and just to talk to people because you don't know who's in that neighborhood who wants to sell unless you talk to them, right? Mm-hmm. If you want something, you got to go for it, right? It's like if you don't ask, you're not going to get. And it's like if you don't call or if you drive through the neighborhood and knock on doors, then how are you going to know whether or not there is a paycheck sitting there right in front of you unless you go ahead and do it. And so his his biggest thing for this market for this year, especially in the first quarter, is to focus on listings. Because once we get more listings and we're going to get more opportunities for buyers to buy homes. And so, you know, how it's ever going to, you know, cultivate into a normal real estate market, you know, I really don't know. I I mean, it's it is extremely challenging because the other factor we didn't even talk about was the i buy who is, mm. you know, to me, you could say what you want from an investment, being an investor is one thing, because this is really a good market to be, even though we don't have like the price points for flipping homes like you did three, four years ago, but you would want to be in a market like this when you do flip a home, because you know it's going to sell right away. Even probably yeah. before the paint dries, you've got people looking to purchase that home. But as we talked about covid that was a disruptor. Do you think that the I buyer factor in a very high demand market is a disruptor? So I was just talking to somebody else about this question. You know, it's so hard to say, do I think it's a disruptor? You know, it, it goes by what's the definition of a disruptor? Uh, to me, a disruptor is like complete chaos and they change the whole way you do business and it's just complete like you know, throwing a freaking big rock into a calm pond. Like it disrupts the entire industry. And I don't see that. And the reason why I don't is because I buyers only make up, even if I gave them the, the, the highest level, they only make up, I, I say 20%, very loosely. It's probably even lower than that. They don't make up, up the majority of the market. Now, if it was the opposite way and they were taking and dominating 80% of our sales, then we would have an issue, a bigger issue than we're already dealing with. But I think they only make up a small percentage of our marketing sales. So are they a disruptor? I would, you know, you'd have to really coach me into that one in in, in reference to that. I think they are a player. Mm -hmm. There's somebody like, hey, you got to watch that person over there. They're there. You see them. But I don't think they're like a quarterback of the team of a that is, you know, a Tom Brady or a Peyton Manning where like you have to focus completely on them. You got to pay attention to them. You got to see what they're doing. Um, we do mock interviews all the time where I tell people just do your own house so you can see how they work. They strategize. But, you know, the biggest thing with, with you know, I buyers is you're paying for convenience. You, you lose the lack of relationship. And I think we're a relationship world where we still enjoy that. We still in, like being able to talk to somebody. A computer cannot replace a relationship and so you're going to lose some deals with i buyers but i think the overall effect a relationship is still the the bread and butter of real estate is my personal opinion and what i've read yep i totally agree with you i think they're here right now where will where will they be in two three years you know i don't know so but we just you know they're they're in the game and so we have to play with them and um, we just have to up our game, and, and I totally agree with you. So uh, anything well, so – the other thing, I, I want to add one more thing to the iBuyers because some people listening right now probably don't even know what an iBuyer is because in, in New York, it's not there yet, especially in the upstate New York area where I'm at. I know Michigan 
and where I have a team up there that I coach, they're not really like I buyers aren't so much. So it's only in certain cities too. So that's the other disruptor where I think of like, like COVID that was a disruptor. It fell across the country, all over the place. I buyers, they just don't feel that they have that full snowball to be able to make that huge, that make that huge in, impact. But they're definitely players that we need to focus on. And, and the other thing I'll add on this and iBuyers, they are not going away anytime soon. Why is that? Is because in Charlotte industry, when I was probably about seven or eight years ago, it used to be called America's Home for Rent. They're one of the largest home ownerships in the country. But you don't see them very often, right? Well, all these investors and these iBuyers that are buying homes, their formula is within five to eight years. So what we're seeing is gonna be very different very shortly here, and I think we're gonna come across this in probably the next three to five years, is these iBuyers, are, we're gonna to have to deal with them on selling. And when the market shifts, it's gonna be harder for buyer agents to have t conversations because we're gonna be dealing with computers. We're gonna be dealing with, all right, go to this website, scan this QR code to apply and, and to submit your offer and we'll respond to you with our app. Like, I think we're gonna have a whole nother challenge in three or five years, but that's a, another conversation to have at another time. But I could see that forecasting happening at some point. The words that came to my mind is buy and hold. I think that they are they do know, especially down here in the South and in our market, it's a high demand market. And like you said, other places around the country, uh, they're not prevalent or they're starting to get in there. It's not a demand market, but buy and hold is what they're looking at. You know, they're going to eat a little bit more of their profit that they probably would normally because yep. they know in three to five years that there's, they still have their inventory. And then they're going to see where the market's at, and then they're going to start flooding the market out with – because right now, they're, many of them are just, you know, they're just rental properties is what they are. And so – and then that's a whole other conversation with, in, with the, the amount of uh, rental rates going up. How, how long can people stay like that and, you know, if they still can't get a home? But anyway. But also, man, listen, I really love the, the fact that you've gone through all of these, the, you know, the four eyes and what we're dealing with and, you know, getting into – this is our blooming market, right? The spring market is coming upon us. The weather here now is really turned around. We're getting into the high 70s and 80s, and, uh, and I don't know where people are across the country, but the weather's going to turn around. The market's going to start. We are going to see more homes out there, but we'll say that, you know, those of you that are listening to our podcast, if you want to know more about what we do and what Brock does with our team, we just want you to reach out, uh, talk to us about it. We will have all of our information on the platform for you. Just give us a call or just join us. 